Listen, this week as I was preparing, I was reminded about my love for the Word of God. Come on, how many of you love the Word of God? Let me put your hand up really high if you love the Word of God. Yeah, we love the Word of God. Listen, this, this is just some of my favorite scriptures. Hebrews 4.12, for the Word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Come on, the Word of God is alive and powerful. Listen to this. This is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. It says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us. Everybody say corrects. Yes. It corrects us when we are wrong. Whoa, preacher, we're not supposed to ever be wrong. You can't say that, but the Word of God realizes that sometimes we are wrong, and the Word of God corrects us when we are wrong. It teaches us to do what is right. But look at this. In James chapter 1, verse 21, it says, So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives, and humbly accept the Word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. Come on, the Word of God is powerful. And it's not just hearing the scriptures. It's not just hearing. A lot of people think that it's just hearing the scriptures. It has a minimal impact on your life. It's when the word of God gets down deep in your heart that it changes your life. It's the implanted word. Look at this, Psalm 119, verse 11. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Come on, these are great scriptures. Are you with me today? Do you see it? Do you hear it? The living word of God will teach us, correct us, train us when it is implanted in our hearts and when it is hidden in our hearts. And I love that, you know, we, we think about hidden and people think that, oh, it, it means private. It means like as if it were hidden from others. That's not what that means. That's not what that means at all. It means that it's so down deep within that when life issues come up, that word of God's already there versus, you know, memorization. You know, I'm, I'm, some of you are great at memorization. You know, I, you always hear these people, I memorize whole chapters of the Bible. I'm like, you know, yippee skippy. I can't do that. It's just not the way my memory works. Half the time I can't remember my wife's name. What's your name again? Just kidding. <laughs> okay, I've got her name, but I mean, I, I just struggle memorizing a lot of simple things. And, but when the Word of God is hidden in your heart, it's not right there on the surface where it's like a memory. It's like it's down deep because it becomes part of your DNA. That's what the Word of God is hidden in our hearts. Okay? So when the Word of God is implanted in our hearts, it can teach us, correct us, and train us. And now let's read this when passage one more time. Are you with me? 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 24, and it says this, Don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. I love this passage. This is one of my life passage is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. You see, Paul is using an analogy here. And the first analogy that he's using in this particular passage is that of a race. All right? Are you with me? So he's using this analogy of a race. And uh, a few weeks ago, while, while preparing for this series, I was reading commentaries and uh, you know, doing deep dive in the meanings of this particular passage. And I'm also, I know a lot of you know this, maybe you don't, but uh, I'm, in a, I'm getting my master's degree right now, so I'm doing a lot of reading. And I will tell you this, about 90% of that is value-adding, mind-blowing. It's so incredible. I, I love studying the Word of God uh, like this. But can I be honest with you? There's that other 10% where I'm like, really? Was that necessary? Did you really need to write that much about that topic? I think I'm actually dumber now for having read 
what I just read there a moment ago. And that's how, especially when you get into commentaries, it's like, have you ever noticed how politicians seem to need to create laws just so they can feel like they're doing something in office? And you're like, you just wish they would all stop trying to create new laws. How many of you with me on that? Well, I think people who write commentaries kind of feel the same pressure. Like, well, even though they have nothing really to add to a particular scripture or passage, they feel like they need to so in order to add value to them being a, a commentator. And uh, it, it, sometimes it just goes way overboard. One such case is I was reading about this passage and, and one person went into way too much detail about the history of the Olympic Games and how the Olympic Games had started before this time and how would have been uh, relevant and familiar to the culture that Paul was, was, was teaching and talking to in, in, Corinth, in Corinth. And I had to laugh. <laughs> I, I had to laugh like, oh yeah, good thing you cleared that up. Like Paul was using an analogy that no one, like he said, don't you know that all the runners run in a race? Runners? What's a runner? race? What is this newfangled thing? Listen, I, now I can't prove it, but you know, I've been around ministry for a long, long time, been reading the Bible a long, long time, and I'm fairly confident. In fact, I'm really confident that the very first uh, foot race in human history started when Cain hit Abel and said, tag, you're it. And the race was on, Right? Because there's few things that are more intuitive to a child than racing. Come on, are you with me? I mean, very few things. Kids, they just come out of the womb wanting to race, wanting to run, wanting to be the first one there. And they want to be the first one anywhere, right? Come on, if you've been around little kids, they want to win the race. Now, as a father of three boys, I can't tell you the number of times I arrived just a few steps behind my kids to find out they won. They, I didn't know we were racing, but they were announcing to me about this victorious achievement because, you know, they touched the door first. They got to the car first. They, whatever it was we were doing, they did it first. I didn't have to teach them to them. Like, boys, sit down. I've got to tell you about racing. Everywhere you go, you got to be first. I never had that talk. It's just ingrained into our, 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 our human nature to want to race, to want to be fast, to want to be first. So I'm telling telling you, with or without the Olympics, which is pretty cool that it was before that, but with or without the Olympics, I promise you the people that Paul was preaching to understood what a race was and understood what a runner was. It didn't take an Olympic game savvy culture to understand what Paul was saying here. Look at verse 24. Don't you realize that in a race everyone runs but only one person gets the prize? And I love this line. Come on, I hope you love it too. So run to win. Paul is saying winning in life is not an automatic process. It's not an automatic process. All the runners run. Do you see it? All the runners run. But only one gets the prize. So in other words, if you're not running to win, you're not going to. But he's not just talking about winning in life. He's talking about winning in your walk with God. You understand that, right? Paul's not giving a lecture about athletics. Paul's talking about being on the mission of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we know that because look at the last part of verse 27. He says, I fear that after, what's that word? Fear that after preaching, wait, we thought we were talking about running. I thought we were talking about boxing. No, what he's really talking about is preaching. I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. The issue is not running an actual race or boxing in a real match. This is all about Jesus. It's about sharing Jesus with others. Look, let's just look. I wish I could just do a deep dive and we could go through Corinthians. Maybe someday we will. But let's, if we just skim over the next couple of chapters, I want you to see what comes out. Look at chapter 10, verse 13. It says, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. Someone should say amen right there. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so you can endure. 
Come on. Now listen, I, I, I will say this, you know, I love times I'll say, well, this is one of the most familiar passages in the Bible. Well, this isn't one of the most familiar, but this is definitely, if you're an intermediate Christian, I mean, you're, you're more than just a newcomer, you've been around church for a while, you've probably heard this word, this verse, most, a lot of people are familiar with this verse, but you know, a lot of people are not familiar with Verse 14, look at what it says. So, my dear friends, flee from the worship of idols. See, we, we look at temptation and we think, oh, well, temptation is anything I'm tempted to that has a negative outcome. Like, obviously, adultery is bad because it could ruin a marriage. Obviously, you know, taking drugs is bad because it can ruin your life. But it's bigger than that. The temptation is anything that is displeasing to God, anything that pulls you away from God, which is, by the way, idolatry. You don't have to have a wooden idol in your home that you bow down and worship for that to be an idol. An idol is anything that you pay your respects to other than God, that you worship other than God. Are you with me today? So he's saying, look, there's no temptation except that it's common to everybody else. And God's going to give you a way out when you're tempted. You're not going to be tempted beyond that which you're capable of resisting. So flee from the worship of idols. Well, that should be good news for you right there. That's powerful stuff, right? Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Just a few verses later in verse 21, you cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and from the cup of demons too. You cannot eat at the Lord's table and at the table of demons too. Are you with me here, people? Amen. This is so good, right? Come on, say it. this is good if it's good. Yes. Come on, look at just a few verses later, verse 23. You say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. What is he talking about here? What is Paul talking about? Let me tell you, he's talking about the difference between winning and losing. That's what he's talking about. He says, listen, not all the runners run, so only one gets the prize. Not all the runners win. They all run. But not all the runners win. Only one gets the prize, run to win. And then he goes on and on about all the different ways that people who claim to follow God are running, but they're not running to win. They say, I'm allowed to do anything. That's the grace junkie crowd. The people that everything's under grace. Oh, I can do anything. I can live any other way. I can, do, I can live any lifestyle I want to. I can consume any, any beverage. I can consume any, any substance. I can do whatever I want to. But listen, he said you, can, you may be allowed to do it, but it's not good for you. You may be allowed to do it, but it's not beneficial. And he's talking about, so the difference there is about the difference between running to win and not. All right? So we have a Christian culture today where more people are running just not to lose instead of running to win. Come on, do you know what I'm talking about? Have you ever played a game with someone who's playing not to lose and it's just frustrating? They're just trying to do just enough, just to get by, just not to be the last person, just playing not to lose. I'm telling you, no serious athlete in no serious category in any respect respects somebody who's playing not to lose. Right? We respect people who are playing to win. People in our culture today, so many Christians in our culture today, they're just doing Christianity not to lose. They're not serving God to win. People in our culture today are afraid to make commitments, don't want to make commitments, don't want to, don't want to commit their time, don't want to. I'm telling you what, do you know what's so hard about this right here? Do you know why people don't want to do it? I'll tell you why. They don't want to make a commitment. They want to say, well, well, when I'm inspired, I'll, I'll reach into my wallet and give you something. That, that's what, and, and listen, that's, that's why the pervasive era of putting starving kids on the screen and all these things to do that to, to motivate you, to inspire you to give has run its course. But listen, that, that's not the right way for you to be motivated. The right way for you to be motivated is because you're being obedient to God. And that's why people resist it. That's why people don't like it. Because it's a commitment and our culture doesn't want to make commitments because they're not playing to win. They're just playing not to lose. 
Listen, I see a lot of churches around the state and in our area. I see a lot of churches. I've been to a lot of churches around. And uh, just being honest with you, there are, a maj- I would say, this is a perception, a majority of churches that are not doing anything. Everybody say anything. Say, there's so many churches that are not doing anything to minister to the people who do not already go to that church. Okay, do you hear me? They're, 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 they're all, every decision they make, every dollar they spend, the way they think, the songs they pick, the messages they preach, it's all about keeping the people that are already here happy. It's about keeping their crowd happy. And I can tell you, man, I can, I, I can tell you, I, I bear the scars because it is not easy to keep a crowd happy. It's not an easy thing to do. In fact, it's, it's very hard to keep people happy. And listen to this. It is really, it's, it's near impossible. It is, no, it is impossible to keep the crowd you have happy at the same time you're trying to reach people that are not already in that crowd. Because I don't care when you came in, when you came to the church, that's like, okay, I'm here now. That's it. Freeze it. Don't change anything. Okay, and as soon as we start changing anything, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you already, I need to, I'm taking the Sunday after we put the chairs in off because somebody's going to complain. Oh, just so you know, they're not going to be laid out like this. They're going to be new aisles and new shapes. We're going to do new things. And somebody's going to complain about it. Well, I don't like the way those chairs are. I don't think we had, we needed more aisles. The aisles aren't wide enough. The aisles are too many. There's too few. They're too far. Ah! You can't keep the people you have happy at the same time you're trying to reach new people. It just can't be done. And so so because of that, you have so many churches that have quit trying to win and just switched to just playing not to lose, just running not to lose. But let me tell you something, at Full Life, we're not running not to lose, we're running to win. Come on, you hear me? We're not running not to lose. We are running to win. And listen, Paul, if, if winning in your walk with God is possible, what else is possible? It's not a trick question, people. If winning is possible, what else has to be possible? Losing. When no one will say it. They're all afraid to say it. Losing is possible because we have this ideology and especially in modern Christianity that losing in Christianity is not possible because we think victory is why I showed up. And that, that the bar is so low in our culture today. If winning is possible, then losing is also possible. And so Paul brings out three keys to winning. Three keys. He brings out discipline, training, and purpose. And would you agree with me right now? Just, just nod if you're in agreement with me that these three words are not common words in the Christian culture of the world today. They're just not there. In fact, I think it's safe to say that in most Christian culture today, those three words are actually avoided. The idea that discipline is necessary is too harsh and judgmental and it should be avoided. Training, no, we don't train, we discover, we learn, we don't train. Purpose, the purpose is whatever I feel at that particular moment. The only problem with that is it does not line up with the word of God. So let's talk about discipline for a minute. Look at this, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25 says, all athletes are, what's that word? Disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away but we do it for an eternal prize. Did did you see that? They do it to win a prize that will fade away. Look at those next three words. I really want you to see those next three words. Okay, four words, next four words. But we do it. Okay, we do what? What is it we do? What is it? What, what is he saying there? 
They do it for a price. What, 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 is, what is it in the sentence? What is it? The athletes are disciplined in their training. So disciplined training is it. Would you agree with me that it refers to disciplined training? He's saying that athletes have disciplined training for a prize that's worthless, fades away. It's a, it's a ribbon, it's a trophy, it's a medal, it's, it's garbage. But we do it. What is it we do? We have disciplined training for a prize that will not fade away for an eternal prize. What he's saying is it means that we should be disciplined for an eternal prize. Well, we all agree, at least I think most of us agreed just a moment ago, this type of language, this type of thinking, this type of talking is not commonplace in the Christian culture of our world today. So we need discipline training. We don't need to avoid the difficult subjects. We don't need to pretend they don't affect us. We don't need to pretend it's not really happening to us. We don't need to keep these things unmentionable. But the reality is sexual temptation is a, a real problem in our culture today. Can I get an amen to that? And I'm going to talk to the men of our church this Saturday morning about how to fight that temptation like a man. Plus, we're going to have a really great breakfast, too. I'm not joking. I just talked to James. He was back in the kitchen. We're having the breakfast casserole, which basically James goes to Costco, buys one of everything, bakes it into a thing, and it's, it's just heaven in a pan. It, it literally is the best thing you could ever taste. Right? And that, we're going to have pancakes and other good things, I'm sure. But I know, oh, and ham. I think, did you say ham? And, uh, and if you haven't experienced the cooking of James Jackson, that alone should be a reason for you to be at the men's breakfast next Saturday. But I'm telling you, it's going to be incredible. But I'm, here's my question. I wonder how many of our guys will be there. Oh, well, that's awesome. Thank you for raising your hand. It's going to be awesome. You know, the reality is a lot of times we put things like this on and not very many people do show up. Now, I know that there are some people you've got legitimate obligations that you cannot realistically get out of. Uh, and I get that, so I'll shame off of you. But the reality is that the majority, that the, those people that have obligations they can't get out of, it's, it's, a, it's a small percentage compared to the number of men in this room right now. The vast majority of those people who will not come or do not come, it's because they don't want to. They haven't made it a priority. Even some of the people who have to work could say, could go to their boss sometimes, and say, hey boss, my church is having a men's breakfast and they're talking about sexual purity. And man, do I need to hear it. Would it be okay if I come in a couple hours late? <laughs> Maybe you should join me, you know, that kind of thing. But we don't want to do that. We just assume that we don't really need it. But that's because our culture has switched from playing to win to just simply playing not to lose. Okay, listen to this. Uh, all these statistics are in the uh, message notes. If you didn't know we have message notes, just go to flfc, flfc.church, click message notes, really easy. And all of these are there. They're there almost every week. Listen to this, 68% of the church-going men view porn on a regular basis. Of young Christian adults, 18 to 24 years old, that goes up to 76% who actively search for porn. Now listen, what's even scarier than that is the number of people who don't see a problem with it. According to a 2018 Gallup poll, 67% of men aged 18 to 49 said pornography is morally acceptable. Now listen to this, if you don't realize just how pervasive and how prevalent Pornography is in our culture, because I know some of you are like, well, I don't, can't be that bad. Listen to this. This is, it blows my mind. There are around 42 million porn sites, which totals around 370 million pages of porn. Oh, man. And then you, you think about this, this is a supply and demand dynamic, Right? The reason that exists is because there is a demand for it, right? 
This, this one just absolutely blows my mind, and I think I shared it before, but this is new data and uh, still shocking to me. The porn industry's annual revenue is more than the NFL, NBA, and MLB combined. Holy moly. It is also more than the combined revenues of ABC, CBS, and NBC. And that should shock you. It shocks me. And if you don't think it's an issue, you don't see the big deal. Listen to this. Pornography use increases the marital infidelity rate by more than 300%. Listen to this one, 57% of pastors say porn addiction is the most damaging issue in their congregation. 69% say that say porn has adversely impacted the church. Why is that? Because churches are full of people running not to lose instead of running to win. Did you hear what I said? It's because churches are full of people who are running not to lose, just doing enough. Oh, God will forgive me. Oh, it's not a big deal. Oh, it's this. Oh, it's that. Instead of running to win, instead of getting serious about your walk with God, instead of really dealing with, remember what Paul said? Your temptation is just like everybody else's, and you won't be tempted beyond that which you're capable of, but God will give you a way of escape. I'm probably muddling up like four different translations there, but you get the gist. And remember that he said that in just a few verses after saying, don't you know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize, so run to win. I love this. Look at this verse, verse 26. Paul says, so I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. <laughs> love that. Not just most steps, not just the church steps, the steps on Sunday, but every step is done with purpose. And I love the not shadow boxing. He means real. I, you know, You know there's like a uh, uh, <laughs> a modern translation of the Bible that takes that word out somewhere it says, I'm not just pillow fighting, you know, because it's, you know, they, they feel like it's toxic masculinity. <laughs> Listen, the most toxic thing about masculinity in our culture today is the absence of it. Yeah. Do you hear me? If you're raising little boys, let them be little boys. Let them be dirty, let them be smelly, let them play outside. Don't let them pick their gender. God already did that. That's one less thing you have to worry about. Okay? God already chose their gender. You let them be boys. And if you're raising little girls, let them be girls. I didn't raise any little girls, so I can talk more about little boys. I remember when we were new here, two of our boys were back in the play area, I mean the kids area, and they got in a fight, right? And the teacher of the day came and, and talked to us, to, to Naomi and I, with horror on their face. She was like, one punched the other one in the face. And we were like, and? Did they die? Was there blood? I mean, we just call that a Tuesday at our house. I mean, come on, how many of you have raised more than one boy? You can understand that that's just the way boys are. Listen, I was the youngest of four, but I have three older sisters. So I got beat up all the time, but my version of getting beat up was I got scratched and I had my hair pulled. <laughs> And you're like, well, that's sexist. No, that is history. I am telling you a fact of what happened and what my life was like. They also dressed me up as a girl. And uh, <laughs> so you can only imagine if I'd been raised in today's culture, what kind of drama that would have led to. But I, I think I came out okay. 
We need to run with purpose in every step. Every step of your life needs to be connected to God. Every step you take, every decision you make should be done with purpose as you pursue a relationship with Jesus. Look at the first part of verse 27. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Oh, do you see that? Discipline and training. Think about that. If I said for this next week, I want you to eat a diet of only vegetables, just vegetables. By the way, that would be like a real Daniel fast, not the way we do Daniel fast these days. Okay, but let's just say for one week, you said, I'm only going to eat vegetables. How many of you know what you would be face to face with almost instantly? Discipline. Because you'd run out of desire in a real quick hurry, right? And you'd have to train. You'd have to rethink the way you do it, rethink your old habits. It would not be easy. Raise your hand if you know that would not be easy. I mean, unless you're already a vegetarian and it's all you eat anyway, most of us know that would not be easy. And that's the point. Discipline and training are not easy. But the pervasive message in our Christian culture today is that God died to make your life easy. And he did not die to make your life easy. He died to give you a purpose. And in order for you to win at that purpose is going to require discipline and training. I was, I was really contemplating this idea of training and how polar opposite it is to what has become the norm in our culture today, which is the opposite of training, at least in the way I'm rationalizing this, is discovery. I know it's not a literal opposite, but is that the way we approach things in our life today is by discovery. Is we try to look deep within and discover who we really are. Tell me that that language is not something you're familiar with. You just need to look within and discover who you really are or your true self, or this one, just to, just to add another layer of drama, we'll say our true est self. I don't know the difference between your true self and your true est self, but apparently there's a distinction, okay? But the, the absolute normal th uh, ideology in our culture today is that discovering your true self is something you discover by looking deep within. Can I help you today? That's not right. You don't discover who you really are. You decide who you really are. Come on, somebody. Now, listen, I mean this, and I'm not trying to be provocative. I'm just trying to be honest. It doesn't matter where you end up, whether you end up homosexual, transgender, or a devout, disciplined Christian. All of those paths require a decision and discipline and training. We just delude ourselves and, and, and lie to ourselves saying that, oh, that was just me discovering who I really am. No, it wasn't. It was you engaging into a temptation, adopting a culture, and then disciplining yourself to fit into that culture. And for some people, that culture is being as weird as they can possibly be. So you got, you know, guys dressed up as women with a full beard, and it's like, yeah, but that's not discovery. That was you trying to mold into the discipline of being as weird as you could possibly be because you like that attention. It doesn't matter what road, what lane you pick, or which way you go in life. Every one of those requires a decision, discipline, and training. The question is what your decision is going to be. And how disciplined are you? And how are you going to train yourself? Because if you're going to be a devout Christian who obeys the word of God, that's a decision. It starts with a decision. And it's followed by discipline and training in your life. Amen? We've been called to win the race. But you can't win a race you're not running. 
Or you can't win a race, you're running just not to lose. We've been called to win the battle. You can't win a battle you're not fighting. And how many of you know, just you don't have to raise your hand high, maybe just a low hand, how many would acknowledge that overcoming temptation is, it's a battle. Yeah, it is. Absolutely is. And you should never be ashamed that it's a battle. But you should also never be ashamed to fight that battle. Hiding the battle, hiding is retreating. It's, it's, it's the opposite of fighting. You need to engage in the battle. You can't win a battle you're not fighting. And we've been called to win the lost. You can't win the lost if you're not trying. And you know, I think that's a more important line than it sounds like based on cadence and tone. Because <laughs> if, if I were yelling, and win the lost, you know, and everybody's like, oh, that was a big point. But the reality is, you can't win the lost if you're not trying. And the, and the most people attending most churches in our culture today are not trying to win the lost. They're just trying not to be lost. And it's good. Definitely try not to be lost. But we're being called to win the lost. And in order to do that, we've got to be trying. Let me close with this. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says, A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. I love this. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Listen to that. Put on all of God's armor. And I mean, just, I'm sorry, Josh, can you go back one screen? Go back to, there we go. Put on all of God's armor. Look at these next words. So that you will be able to stand. Okay, so what can we extrapolate from just this verse? If we do not put on all of God's armor, come on, what would it say? You will not be able to stand against all the strategies of the devil. And I wonder how many of us, just based on our own perception of modern Christianity, how many Christians out there do we believe have all of God's armor on them? I mean, raise your hand if you think it's not 100%. You know, it's, it's not. I mean, we don't, I'm not trying to be mean here, so we're not go further than that. I would encourage you this week to study Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, where it talks about all the different pieces of the armor of God. But I don't have time to do that today. Let me ask you a question. Why would you need armor if you can't lose? The reality is you have an enemy and he's got strategies against you. And if you don't stand firm against him, you will fail to be victorious. It does not mean you're going to go to hell. It doesn't mean you're not saved. But it does mean you may be running just not to lose instead of running to win. Christianity is more than a mere feeling. You have a real enemy and he wants you to lose. God has called you to win. But that is not an automatic process. You have to run to win. Amen? The living word of God will teach us, correct us, and train us when it's implanted in our hearts and hidden within our life. <laughs>